Welcome to First Baptist Sparta, and thank you for watching our worship service online. We hope that the hearing of the Word today leaves your faith strengthened and encouraged, and we hope that you'll make plans to come visit us in person soon. For more information about the church, you can either contact the church directly or visit SpartaFirstBaptist.com. If you got your Bible with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 78. We're going to be looking at the first eight verses in Psalm 78. Uh, we're going to take a, a break from the book of Acts this week. I'm sure you're thankful for that. But, uh, and we're going to have a, a family discipleship emphasis. I know we've heard a lot about this family discipleship equip coming up in March. And before we hop into this text, I just want to give a disclaimer that I know that I am the last guy who should be preaching about discipling your kids at home because I just had a baby and don't really have kids at home. I'm no guru and I'm no expert. Cats up the But I want to reassure you that these are not my opinions and these are not my personal methods that we're going to look at this week. Everything that I'm going to say comes directly from Scripture. And so we as Christians are called to submit to that authority, not Holy Spirit. Also, with this week being a family discipleship emphasis, I just want to reiterate that we're having that family discipleship with Saturday, March 9th, to help equip you parents, grandparents, and church leaders for what Psalm 78 is going to call us to do. And that's disciple our children and the coming generations. And so you can register by going online to our website or Facebook page. And if you register before the 24th of this month, your family gets to take home a free resource that's going to help you in discipling kids. So we need you guys to register so that we have a proper head count for food, for child care, all that good stuff. So with that being said, would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. A mascal of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from a old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep His commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let's pray. God, be with us during this time. Speak through your word. So the main idea for today, God commands believers to teach their children about the Lord so that they might trust Him in faithful obedience. Growing up as a kid, many things were passed down to me, both good and bad. It includes skills, values, and even good and bad habits. Now one of the most memorable things that has been passed down through the generations of my family is a love for music, a love for playing the guitar. You know, as a kid, I remember sitting and watching my papa at, at my grandparents' house. And he would sit there and pick his guitar playing bluegrass tunes all day long. And I would watch him play at church on Sundays. And my dad, too. I remember sitting around the house and my dad playing Hank Williams Jr. and Led Zeppelin and Leonard Skinner songs. Year after year, this naturally cultivated a love for music in me. And when the time came, I picked up the guitar and I learned how to play, too. And so everything that my papa learned, he passed down to my dad. And so everything my papa learned, I learned. And then all the stuff my dad learned, he passed to me as well. I learned everything they learned and some. So what we're going to look at today is the call to every believer to take the faith and pass it on to the next generation the way it was passed to us. But this first starts with us learning and believing the things of God. So that brings us to point number one. That believers have collected teaching from past generations about the Lord. Check out the heading and the subheading at the top. In most of your Bibles, it says that this is a mascal of Asaph. Now, a mascal is simply just a musical term that's used throughout the Psalms. Uh, the point of a mascal is to indicate that these words are to be sung as a congregation or individually, but that it's to be sung in class. And I promise I won't start singing. Now, who is this Asaph guy? 
Well, if you remember in reading in 1 Chronicles, King David appointed musicians who serve in his court and his temple. And this guy Asaph, he just so happens to be the chief or music director of the singers and musicians of God. So if you scan your Bible a couple pages to the left and a couple pages to the right, you're going to see that Asaph has written 12 of the 150 psalms. This guy knows his Hebrew history, and he writes this psalm to call the people of Israel to teach the next generation about everything God has done so far and that everything Israel has failed to do so far. And as you can see from the header in your Bible, the focus here is teaching the next generation the things of the Lord. So check out verse 1. Asaph says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Asaph here is drawing the attention of anybody listening or reading this. He's simply saying, Everybody listen up. What I'm saying is important. Listen to the words coming out of my mouth. And notice the tone. He's not just being melancholy. He's not just being chill about this. No, he's trying to get their attention. He's in their face. And he gives the reason why they need to listen up. Look at verses 2 and 3. He says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Asaph wants the listeners to know that what he is about to say is very important, and they need to listen to it. These teachings, these parables, these dark sayings, they're important because they're the words of God in the law. They're the story of God's grace, of his provision, working throughout the course of Israel's history. But they're also stories of God's people not listening and being unfaithful to God, making them deserving of his judgment. You see these words teaching in verse 1 and parables in verse 2. Those can be translated several different ways. A couple different ones are proverb, law, teaching, parable, riddle, etc. The point is, is that what Asaph is telling us here is important. Because it's God's word. And we need to listen carefully to God's word. <clears throat> now, Asaph here reminds me a lot of my dad when I was a kid. And even today, honestly. And i got to be careful because he's here this morning. <laughs> Whenever I would do something stupid and I would get in trouble, like back talk or stay out too late, I always got the talk from my dad. You guys know the talk. Nine times out of ten, I did not care to hear anything that he had to say. Because, in case you guys didn't know, every 17-year-old knows everything in the world, right? <laughs> but his words, they're similar to Asaph here. My dad would say something like, Colby, open your ears and listen to what I'm trying to tell you, man. I'm trying to teach you the same lesson my dad had to teach me. Now, my dad probably wasn't as nice as Asaph is here. And Asaph probably didn't include a wolf. But you get what I'm saying. Check out verse 3. It says, these are the things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. So these things that Asaph is calling us to share are things that he himself and his generation has heard. From where? How did they hear these things? It says that their fathers shared them with them. It was the generation that came before Asaph's that taught his generation, that passed the faith on to his generation. So brothers and sisters, are we inclining our ears to biblical teaching? Do we listen carefully and intentionally to the biblical teaching of our fathers, whether those fathers are spiritual or our actual fathers? Do we cherish and hold fast to the truth that is taught to us by our pastors, by our parents or grandparents, or other leaders in the church? Asaph here sure treasures the teaching from his father and from the previous generation, and I think that sets the example for us. We can learn from this and embody this principle. We shouldn't just let the teaching and counsel of our spiritual or literal parents go in one ear and out the other. It's important. We should do exactly what Asaph says. Give and incline our ears to the teaching of our pastors and to the older generation. Because this biblical teaching was given to us for our good. And so we see that Asaph is going to tell the things he's collected from the past generation. But now, point number two, we're going to see who he's telling these things to. So point two, believers are called to teach the next generation about the Lord. <clears throat> we're going to camp out here for a minute. So check out verse number four. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. So Asaph says that we shouldn't hide these truths from our children. Rather, we should do the opposite. We should share them. 
And so if you're like me, you're thinking to yourself, well, what are we supposed to tell him? Well, he helps us out here, and he tells us five specific things we're supposed to share with our children and to the coming generation as a whole. These things are found right here in verses 4 and 5. Asaph says that we need to teach them, one, the glorious deeds of the Lord, the, the Lord's might, the wonders he's done, the testimony he established in Jacob, and the law appointed in Israel. And so what I want to do is look at these five things very briefly, I promise, briefly. So one, the glorious deeds of the Lord. What are the glorious deeds of the Lord? Think about the stories that you hear in Sunday school. The creation account of God speaking the universe as we know into existence. How God sent rain and flooded the whole earth and spared one family. The plagues that he sent on Egypt. How he brought the people of Israel through the Red Sea from bondage to Egypt. You name it. All of these great stories throughout the Bible are God's glorious deeds being displayed. The second thing listed is the Lord's might. Now, when you think about the Lord's might, think about when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in an instant for their sin. Think about when God opened the entire earth to swallow up Korah and his followers for their rebellion against Moses. His might's displayed in using Joshua to conquer the promise, <coughs> in using the judges to judge Israel, and in using David to conquer Goliath and the Philistines. That's the might of the Lord. The third thing he includes are the wonders. The wonders God has done. To see his wonders, we need to look no further than this very song. Check out verses 12 through 16. It says, In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it, and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. And then verses 23 and 24, he says he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. And he rained down on them <coughs> and gave them the grain of heaven. God has used all his awesome power to perform miraculous wonders in the presence of his people. That's the wonders he's done. And then fourthly, it's the testimony that he established in Jacob. Now Jacob here is just another name for Israel. So get Israel in your mind, nation of Israel. God raised up the nation of Israel to be set apart from the rest of the world. As one commentator put it, God gave his law and God gave his ordinances to Israel that that nation might be to all the earth a witness of the truth. God wanted to use them as a representative of himself to the rest of the sinful and pagan world. And then the last thing he lists in these verses is the law that was appointed in Israel. The last of these things listed is the Mosaic law that Moses received on Mount Sinai. And the law was given to the people of God so that they would know God's character and so that they could reflect God's image more thoroughly. <coughs> Again, if you're like me, you may be wondering, why do I need to teach these things to my children or the children in my life? Asaph again gives us the answer. He says that we should tell them to our children so that they would know them. So that they would know them, tell their children about them, and that they would hope in God, remembering the works he's done and obeying his commandments. Look at that key word hope in verse 7. If you've got a pen in your hand, circle that key word hope. That's a word you need to circle. The point of telling these things to the next generation is not solely about pumping your head full of biblical knowledge. Don't get me wrong. We definitely want to do that. But we don't want it to just affect their head. We don't want them to just be arrogant Bible scholars. We also want it to affect their heart. And that's what Asaph is getting at here. We want their lives to be changed as a result of what they're learning. And so we've got to ask the question, why is it so important that it's the Bible that we teach? I believe Paul tells us in 2 Timothy when he writes, it says, All scripture is breathed out by who? By God. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Regarding God's words, the author of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and active, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Or think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying for the disciples and he asked God to sanctify them in truth. And then Jesus declares, your word is truth. And then in, in Romans, Paul says that faith comes from hearing and hearing through what? The word of Christ. The Bible is clear on the doctrine of Scripture. It's the word of God that is eternal. It's the word of God that's going to bring dead souls to life. It will not return void. It promises us that. It's the truth in the scriptures that are going to lead our children to salvation. That's why God is not interested in us being able to tell Bible stories that we don't even believe ourselves. Knowing the things of God is not a substitute for knowing God. Notice how Asaph doesn't just stop with saying that we should teach our children the things of God so that they just know them. It doesn't end there. Knowing the stories and knowing the works is just a means to an end. Teaching these stories of the Bible to our children, the goal is not mere memorization. That's definitely part of it. We want them to memorize the stories of the Bible and the truths of the Bible. But our ultimate goal is for them to love and fear God and obey Him. Or as Asaph puts it, the goal is for them to hope in God and respond in obedience. And so I've got to ask, do we desire to see the children in our lives on fire for Christ? Do we long to see them faithfully hoping in God and obeying Him? I pray that each Christian in this room does. So what do we do with that desire to see them saved? Let me give you a practical example. You're sitting on the couch and you're teaching your kids about David and Goliath. You're running them through that story. The goal is not that our kids just know about a guy who rocked a giant with a rock. That's a means to an end. What we want them to understand and what we want them to believe is that Christ is the greater David. In the sense that he slayed the giant of sin, Satan, and death through his death and resurrection. Sunday school teachers, we don't simply just teach that Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery because we want our kids to know cool stories in the Old Testament. No. What we desire is for them to see how Christ is the greater Moses who leads us out of slavery to sin and into freedom through his death and resurrection. The goal of teaching our kids and the kids in our church is to point them to eternal life in Christ. Every Bible story, pointing them to Christ. And I've got to say it is so sad and unacceptable how often it's neglected. Let me give you a biblical example of what the consequences are when the things of God are not passed down to the next generation. Hold your finger in Psalm 78. Don't lose your place. We're going to come back. But flip over to Judges 2. Judges chapter 2. While you're flipping there, Joshua has just led the people of Israel into the promised land, but they have not done everything God has told them to. They were supposed to drive out the pagan people groups who lived there with their idolatrous practices. That's what God told them to do. Well, did they do that? No, they didn't. And as a result, it had consequences. So chapter 2, Judges chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 says this. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years old. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnah Perez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. Verse 10, focus in on verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So Joshua has died and is gone. And it says that another generation rose up. And how do they describe that generation? They didn't know God, and they didn't know what he had done. And so what was the result of that? Look at verse 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served false gods. They became idolatrous. That's the danger of not teaching our children. Their souls are at stake. Neglecting to pass down the faith to them and to pass down the stories of the Bible to them, as seen in Joshua, 
leads to children living, living sinful lives in rebellion to God. None of us want that. And I believe there's another danger that we must be wary of when discipling our children. And that danger is simply teaching them morality that is not rooted in knowing and loving God. Now there's nothing wrong with wanting our children to be people of good morals. That's a good thing. The deeper issue is why do we want them to have good morals? Is it because we want our children to obey God out of love and fear? Or do we want them to just be upstanding citizens in the community? Morality that's not rooted in loving God is in vain. I'm going to say that again. Morality that is not rooted in loving God is in vain. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 7. <clears throat> not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Notice why they must depart from him. Because they never Church is not a change in behavior. That's the root problem of sinners. And that includes children. The root problem is sin. Sin has separated us from God and has kept us from truly knowing Him. So teaching our children to be moral people is counterproductive when all they desire is wickedness and sin. That's what Romans teaches us about man. Romans 3 says that none is righteous, that no one does good, no one seeks after God. Their issue is not behavior at the deepest level. They have a heart problem, just like everyone in the world, and it has to be changed. So how are they going to change? How are they going to love God so that they do the right things as an overflow? The answer is the gospel. It always has been and it always will be. It's when we teach them the truth and stories of the Bible, are we pointing them to Jesus over and over? The gospel message that has saved us can and will save them. It's the truth that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's that truth that can and will change the hearts of our children, both at home and in the church. It's only through faith in the gospel of Christ that they will desire God himself. It's only through trust in the work of Christ that they will truly know God and then desire to obey him. That's when true and righteous morality comes. It flows from a place of knowing and loving God. Jesus said that in John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus made it abundantly clear that obedience flows out of love for him. Flows from salvation, not for salvation. This is the whole purpose of teaching the things of God. When we teach our children not to lie or not to steal... And they ask us, why? Well, of course we're going to answer, because God said so in the Bible. However, when we have not diligently taught them about who God is and the things that God has done, the amazing God that He is, of course they're going to disregard Him. Of course they don't care that He said that. They don't care to listen to the command not to lie because they don't fear the God who commanded it. The point of telling the wonders of God in the Bible is to display His power to our children so that they would respond in love and fear that leads to obedience. That's the point of always pointing them to the gospel, is so that they would love and cherish Christ for the sacrifice that He has made and then respond in obedience. A fear and a love for the Lord produces obedience. Let me paint a picture of why this is worth it. Why accepting this call to discipling our children is worth it. <clears throat> I want you to imagine two different children. On one hand, you have a kid who has been discipled, who has been taught the Bible, has been led to Christ. And on the other hand, you have one who hasn't had those things, has not been discipled or led to Christ. But this kid prioritizes money, popularity, and the things of the world. Now, think of when both of these kids grow up. And in most cases, there's going to be a major difference, right? Right? For the one that was led to Christ and taught faithfully and discipled, 
in most cases, their life is going to be marked by the fruits of the Spirit. You're going to see these things evident in their life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But for the kid who was not led to Christ and not discipled, oftentimes their life is going to be marked by works of the flesh. And this is how Paul describes the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality, envy, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, anger, jealousy, division, and drunkenness. Which one of these do we want the children in our lives to be when we grow up? I mean, I believe the answer is obvious. We as Christians, of course, want the first result. We want our children to embody the fruits of the Spirit. And so parents and church Christians, we're called to action. We have a direct order from our Lord to teach our children. Listen to Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And here it is. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the command there to the parents of Israel was to teach their children about the Lord. <laughs> But notice the emphasis on how parents, how often parents are supposed to be doing this. They're to teach the Bible when they're sitting, walking, lying down, when they're awake, and when they're moving around. They're to do it all the time. It's to be a habit of life. Now, based on what Deuteronomy just said, let's try to match up our lives with that call. And let me just say, I fall short. I fall short. I do. Think about how much time we <coughs> spend at school. I crunched the numbers. And it's somewhere between 35 and 40 hours per week. Think about how much time is spent on the ball field. How much time is spent with friends. And how much time is spent at home. Now, compare that to how much time is spent at church. At best, if they're here on Wednesday and Sunday, it's three hours. So let me ask. What message are we sending to our kids when everything else in life takes up all the time in the week, but the Bible and Jesus gets three hours. Now hear me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with school or sports or hanging out with friends. Those things are all great, and I love all of those things. But it's when those things take precedence over our kids' discipleship, there's an issue. This is why family discipleship in the home is so important. Children spend more time at home than they do here at church. They get biblical teaching more consistently when their parents do it at home each and every day. Rather than just relying on church to do it. And let me just say, I fall short of it. I fall short of discipling my family. See? She said amen. She said amen. He says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up into discipline and instruction of the Lord. Church, the Bible is clear. The Bible leaves no room for neglecting discipleship in our homes. Now, you might be a couple whose kids have moved out, don't live at home anymore. And maybe there is some regret of not teaching them diligently about the Bible. And pointing them to Christ and discipling them like the Bible says. <clears throat> I just want to encourage you this morning. There is forgiveness, there is grace, and there is mercy at the cross. And if that is you this morning, there is redemption for situations like that. <clears throat> I know all of you just saw the kids who went to children's church. And you see the amount of kids running through this church on a Sunday morning. And I'm not just talking about the little ones. I'm talking about newborns and 18-year-olds. There's a, there's a bunch of them here. Teach them. Teach them, teach them, teach them. Invest in these kids. Use the stories of the Bible. Point these kids to Jesus. Be a spiritual parent to them. 
That's what Paul was for Timothy. He was a spiritual father. And maybe you're here this morning, and you did do this with your kids. But they're wayward, and they're not following the Lord. Don't beat yourself up. The Bible does not promise salvation as a guarantee for kids who have been discipled by their parents. The key words here in the text are might or should in verses 6 and 7. Teaching them faithfully does not guarantee their salvation. So if you fill that baggage, leave it. Those children are responsible for their sin and their actions. <clears throat> And while God calls us to be faithful in teaching and raising them in a godly manner, He is ultimately sovereign over their salvation. But let me encourage you. Continue praying for them. Continue connecting with them. Continue sowing those seeds and praying for it to land on good soil. Don't just give up. Keep doing it. And so parents, are we diligently teaching the children in our homes and church? <coughs> The primary focus here in the text is the home. That's where it's supposed to happen. So parents, are we teaching our children about the God that we love and serve each and every day? The God that we go to church to worship? Sunday school teachers and group group leaders, are we teaching the kids in our church about how magnificent Christ is? Are we teaching them about the gospel that will draw them to repentance and faith and obedience? This is for all of us. Not just parents. Are we praying and are we pleading with the Lord for the salvation of our kids at home and in this church? I pray that the Bible pushes us to that resolve. And I believe we will. Because God often uses this very teaching to bring about fruit in the lives of these kids. And in the coming generation. And that leads us to point number three. That believers see the consummation of teaching these things of God. We see the evidence. We see the fruit. Check out verses 5 through 8. It says, He commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. So what we see here in these last few verses is the fruit of faithfully teaching children about who God is and what He's done. Asaph tells us that the children will know the things of God. They'll tell their children about them, and they'll set their hope in God, remembering what He's done and obeying Him as a result. Faithful teaching often produces godly offspring. That's the pattern of Scripture. And Asaph goes on to contrast these offspring that he's talking about with the past generation. And how does he describe them? He says they're stubborn, they're rebellious, they're faithless, and they're idolatrous. Now, who's he referring to here? Think back to the Israelite ancestors who came out of Egypt. We just saw this this morning in student Sunday school. He's referring to those ancestors who came out of Egypt, and all they did was wine, wine, wine. And ever since they were brought out, one theologian described it this way. Unfaithful, provocative, treacherous hypocrites. Israel does not have a good track record for faithfulness towards God in the Old Testament. So what does Asaph give as this sort of medicine for preventing this from the next generation? He says, teach these kids about who God is and what God has done so that they will fear and love Him. Everyone here wants what's best for their kids, do they not? Absolutely. That's the love of a parent. Parents want to see their kids flourishing, living in joy and happiness. But the key to this flourishing is being faithful and raising them in the godly way that the Bible calls us to. Teaching them about Christ and leading them to the gospel is how we lead them into this flourishing, into true joy and satisfaction. Who doesn't want that for their kids? The wisdom of Proverbs is so applicable with what we're talking about. In Proverbs 22, it says, Train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this isn't necessarily a promise, as it is wisdom in raising our kids in godly homes. 
But think about when they're older and they're doing well in life. We don't just want them to boast in themselves. Absolutely not. We want them to rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness and for his provision in their lives. Or think about the opposite. Maybe they're struggling or suffering later in life. We want our kids to know and believe that God is their shepherd. With them in the valley of the shadow of death. With them in storms. Giving them peace and joy in the midst of hardship. But this starts with us teaching them. Asaph agrees with the proverb. Keeping the next generation from being stubborn and rebellious and unfaithful is prevented by faithfully teaching them about God and about His faithfulness. Think about gardening. Think about growing a plant. For a garden or any type of plant to grow healthily and flourish, there's things we have to do for that to happen, right? The first and most important is that a plant needs what? Water. It needs a fuel source. It needs to be fed life. Without water feeding a plant, it's going to die. No doubt about it. Except maybe the cactus. But you must also pick out weeds. You maybe have to put some fertilizer. You might have to prune them, so on and so forth. The point is, is that it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to produce a good plant. It's hard. I remember being in the garden with my dad as a kid and teenager. And I hated it because I sweated a lot. But the consistency, the hard work, paired with God's provision, it paid off. We had a good garden. Discipling our children is very similar. If we want them to grow into mature Christians, we must put in the same hard work and effort. And it's hard. Like a plant, the only way that they're going to change and grow is to be fueled by water. But it's not just any water. It's the living water that Jesus promised. In John 7, he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And hear what Paul says to the Corinthian church when he's talking about growth. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believe as the Lord assigned to each. Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Brothers and sisters, teaching our children about the Lord through the words of Scripture brings our children and our family right to the well of living water. Do we desire to see them spiritually flourishing? Do we long to see them thrive in the faith? Are we doing this diligently and faithfully at home? That's the call. And so this leads us to our application questions for today. So what? I got two questions. The first is, have you received Christ? We see from this text that passing down the faith is a cycle. We receive it from those older than us, in most cases, and we pass it down. And so if you haven't received Christ as your Lord and Savior, do so today. So that you can then pass your faith on to your kids. And the cycle continues, passing on to generation. Faithfully teaching your kids about God with the purpose of leading them to Christ it's probably not going to happen if you don't believe the truth of the gospel. And so if you haven't repented and put your faith in Christ, there's no better day than today to experience God's love through Christ's sacrifice. <clears throat> if you need someone to talk to or to pray with, I'm going to be down at the front ready for you. And if you don't want to come up in front of everybody, I will be the last person to leave this building today so you can come and talk. There's no better day than today to walk in new life in Christ. So would you repent and believe today? The second question. Are you discipling your kids at home and the kids at church? I want to share just a little tidbit of my personal testimony for just a minute. God has blessed my life tremendously with two grandparents who are God-fearing. As a young boy, I spent almost every weekend at my mom and papa's house. And they never wasted that time better believe that they were often talking about Jesus, about what the Bible says, or dragging my nappy-headed butt to church. <laughs> Whether I wanted to go or not, it was not an option. 
And it was on one of those weekends that they took me to church and I didn't want to go that I got saved. I got saved in a tiny little church back where I'm from because my grandma and grandpa said, let's go. If it wasn't for their faithfulness and my parents in discipling me and taking me to church, I can honestly say that I don't know where I'd be right now. The reason that I'm standing in this pulpit preaching from the Bible is because of their faithfulness. I'm here because they accepted the biblical call to raise me up in the way of the Lord. My parents and my grandparents wanted to see me saved and walking with Christ. And I'm forever grateful. And so for the believers that are here this morning, are we diligently and faithfully walking our children through the Bible? Are we teaching our kids and student Sunday schools faithfully from the scriptures? Are we doing this with a Christ-centered view, pointing them to the gospel over and over? Parents that want to do this at home, you can do this in 10 to 15 minutes every day. It doesn't have to be very long, because if you have little kids, their attention span is that big. You can do it on the couch in the evenings. You can do it at breakfast before school, or you can do it before bedtime. It doesn't matter when you do it. What matters is that you do it. God expects it, and he wants and see, to see them saved. He desires to see them saved, and I pray that we desire that. And so the question is, are we raising up the next generation in fear and admonition of the Lord? Let's pray. God, I must confess that I fall short so much of this biblical call. But Lord, I pray that we as a church would embrace the call through your grace and through your mercy to disciple the next generation, to teach them the glorious deeds of the Lord, so that they would know you, know you, truly know you, and that they would love you and respond in obedience and live lives bearing your cross daily in faithful obedience to the King. And so God, I pray that you would use all of us here, whether we're Sunday school teachers or growth group leaders or parents or grandparents, all of us Christians.